ready? I'm ready. Welcome to Financial Clarity for Doctors. I'm Corey Janoff. Rochelle's not joining us today. We got a, an extra special episode with an extra special guest. Uh, my own dad is joining us, uh, Dr. Kenneth Janoff. I guess technically, are you still a doctor or is your still license Still licensed, lab? yes. Nope, I still have a license. There we go. All right, so Dr. Kenneth Janoff, retired vascular surgeon, and we wanted to get some uh, some advice and guidance from someone who's actually made it to the finish line successfully. So thank you for joining. Thank you. So let's maybe start from the beginning and what led you to medicine. You grew up in South Jersey. I think you're always into science as a kid and um, I believe you like dissected frogs and stuff. Oh yeah, I used to catch a lot of animals and I think when I was about 13, my aunt who was a nurse gave me a dissecting kit. So I used to dissect various animals that I'd find and I was always interested in science. And then when I was a junior, I think, uh, junior in high school, there was a science program at then Hahnemann Hospital, which was a medical school in Philadelphia. And I did a summer science program there uh, where we did research and we had lectures, or kind of like medical school lectures. And um, I... I was convinced that's what I wanted to do. I always wanted to be a heart surgeon. So what caused you to change from heart surgery to Well, when, when I was in um, medical school at uh, Temple University in Philadelphia, um, there was a heart surgeon there that um, he caused a lot of trouble. Um, he just didn't. He wasn't happy at Temple, and he made a big stink about the place, and he was kind of a high-maintenance guy. And then when I came to Oregon, um, I got to work with some of the heart surgeons, and pretty much I concluded that um, I, I, didn't, I wasn't crazy about the heart surgeons I had met. And at both places, I had um, done vascular surgery, and I really got along with them a lot. And I liked the surgery of vascular Um at the time, heart surgeons mostly did coronary bypasses, a few um, valves, but um, uh, vascular surgery had a lot more varied surgeries to do, and um, I, I just decided I, I did like that better. Although I did get an offer uh, my second year in residency to become an orthopedist, um, which I really liked when I did it. I, I did a month of it, actually two months as an intern and then three months in my uh, second year. And I really liked it, but I kind of decided that I liked taking care of real sick people. And um, at the time, I liked trauma and, and emergency stuff. And um, I, I thought that was really interesting and exciting. As I got older, I kind of thought maybe I made a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> Fixing bones was a lot less stressful, but at any rate, I, I was pretty satisfied with what I did. It seemed to have worked out all right for you. Yeah. yeah. So backtracking a little bit. So I grew up in Jersey, South Jersey, went north slightly on the turnpike to Rutgers. Yes. And as you said, you were on a mission, which I assumed to get into med school. Well, in those days, like now, it was very difficult to get into med school. And Rutgers, when I, I started Rutgers as a freshman, I forget the exact numbers, but there were, I don't know, like 12, 1,300, mostly guys in the pre-med pre program. And Rutgers had a um, pretty steep curve so that by the end of second year, they wanted to get that down to three or 400 students, and they did. Um, and um, of that group, probably... 20% at the most who would get into med school, at least the first time. So it was pretty cutthroat. Um, but yes, I was on a mission. There we go. And then do you remember what tuition was at Rutgers back I, in the 70s? I do. Um, when I started, uh, my tuition was $200 a semester. Um, my dad, who uh, went there in the 40s, his was 100 Mine was 200, but by the time I finished, it was up to 400. Man. Yeah. Rip off. Yeah. It was uh, much uh, less expensive than today. Yeah. 
Um, so then you graduated Rutgers, went to Temple for med school. Like you mentioned, that was 74 to 78. Is that right? Correct. And I started, I was out of state. So I had to pay out of state tuition, which was $1,000 my first year. Man. And when I finished, it was 7000 So the tuition inflation started back then. Yes. And what was your experience at Temple like? Temple was an interesting place. It was in probably the worst neighborhood in Philadelphia, up in North Philadelphia, and there was a lot of gunshots, stabbings. Um, uh, you know, back then it was very uh, low-income people, a lot of uh, uninsured patients, but it was always exciting. I, I Honestly, on weekends, sometimes Friday nights, Saturday nights, I would go down to the emergency room where – it was manned um, by a lot of um, people who had been in the service and did um, uh, on the field suturing and such. And these guys were phenomenal at suturing. So I used to spend the evening with them. Just They'd let me suture people up and put chest tubes in and such. And it, it, as a medical student, that was pretty cool. Yeah, I bet. Um, and then you there, were there was a lot of pathology there that you – uh, you know, just wouldn't see it. Uh, like it, it was just night and day from there to Oregon. But I, I felt like I was very well prepared to do my internship. That's good. Yeah. Didn't you say once there was like the hospitals locked down because someone broke in trying to kill someone? Or yeah. My very first night on call is a. Uh, I was on the medicine service, um, and we did our afternoon rounds, and and the guys who weren't on call left, and then about. 15, 20 minutes later, they were back because they couldn't get out of the hospital. And it turned out uh, some guy had found his girlfriend with another guy and he shot her in the leg. And then he decided that wasn't good enough. So she had gotten admitted to the hospital and he came back and literally uh, finished the job. And But he, he got loose. But when you looked outside, the riot squad was all around the hospital. I mean, it was pretty exciting at the time. <laughs> Welcome to med school. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then, so you went from Philly, North Philly in the 70s to, at the time, University of Oregon, now OHSU in mm -hmm. Portland. And uh, yes, yeah, so you said that was like night and day. So how, what, were, what were some of the differences? Well, one, I, I mean, when I was a medical student, I used to live up on the north end of town, right on the border um, of Philadelphia. And... For the first couple of years, I took the subway every day, which was an experience in itself. And you got off at this, at Broad and Erie or Broad and Allegheny, which, as I said, was a terrible neighborhood. Um, I did try biking one time, and kids are throwing rocks at you and, you know, making racial slurs to the white white kids. And uh, so I decided that wasn't a good idea. So, and then in... Uh, like third and fourth year, we'd have to drive because it was um, just the hours we had. You, you didn't want to be in the subway at night. And um, so, you know, coming down Broad Street every morning um, through the ghetto and such, um, when I got to OHSU, I, I still remember the first morning walking from Lot 8, the parking lot where the residents parked, and you went across a sky bridge that had this spectacular view of Mount Hood just picture frame like picture there and um i thought i died and went to heaven <laughs> and and the other thing is when i was doing uh, my sub internships as a medical student i mean the, the hospital is so short staffed then that like in, in the evening and night there might be one or two nurses on the floor and the rest were aides so we had to do all the blood draws. We had to hang all the blood. We, I mean, we just did a lot of scut work back in those days. And when I got to Oregon, um, the, the floors, the rooms were shiny, clean, uh, lots of staff. Although we still had to do our own IVs, and and they did they did morning blood draws, but we had to put in IVs, uh, especially at night. Um, but it, it was just a whole different atmosphere, and you didn't have all this knife and gun club such and it was just completely different so what caused you to decide to go opposite end of the country from where you were from and grew up and did all your other training 
Well, part of it, when I was um, in college, my sophomore year in college, that summer, I decided to go to summer school at UC Berkeley. And um, I just loved Berkeley. In fact, I, I wanted to stay there, but uh, my mom kind of vetoed that. Um, but I took biochemistry and um, anatomy that summer. And um, and then after the, after school was done, I had a few weeks and I traveled around the country and went to these national parks and going out we went through the Rockies and we went up to Glacier and um, I, I just fell in love with the mountains in the west and, and the rivers and um, it was just spectacular the scenery and um, one of the things that might sound crazy had a big influence in me looking at Portland was um, when the Sixers played the Blazers, the year the Blazers won the championship, there was an article in the paper in the Philadelphia Inquirer about um, the, Portland and the people there and the living conditions, and, and it described people coming out of the woods to come to the Blazer games, and, and, and it just sounded like, hey, this sounds great to me. <laughs> so I was really intrigued, and then um, when I was a... Uh, Senior in med school, I did a, a rotation in San Diego because I had a uh, actually a heart surgeon at that time was my mentor and advisor, and he knew a couple guys who were from Philly who had gone out to uh, University of California, San Diego, um, and they they were at the VA hospital. They were both surgeons, so I went out there and did a rotation uh, in the burn unit with them. And um, I, I met an intern down there who um, had had come from Oregon, went down to do his internship, and then went back to do anesthesia. And he was telling me about the program and surgery and, and how great the chairman was and, and the facilities and such. Um, so I made, when I finished there, I drove north and, and, uh, and did some interviewing in California and interviewed up in Seattle which I really liked, and, and then uh, at the University of Oregon. And the guy who actually interviewed me uh, was a guy who grew up in Atlantic City, and he was from that area, and we kind of hit it off. Um, so at any rate, I, I ended up uh, ranking uh, University of Washington first because uh, I thought at the time they maybe had a little better program. Um, and then uh, University of Oregon was my second choice, and that's where I got in the match. There we go. The rest yeah. is history. Yeah. <laughs> then you bought your first house in Portland or in residency, right? I did. I when when I came out to Oregon, Oregon was still a bit of a pyramid program, and I don't know if they do that anymore. But basically, we had about uh, I don't know thirteen, fifteen uh, interns who were vying for six spots um, to go on through the residency. So I didn't know if I was going to be here more than one year. Um, and then they made the decision, I think, around November, December. And when I was given the, the spot to stay here, I decided it, it was a six-year general surgery program, so I was going to be here for a while. And at that time, the market was really – the real estate market was doing really well. Um, so I, I um, talked to my dad and – he said he could lend me some money, so I bought a house through this loan to lenders program and got an interest rate at the time, which was phenomenal. At I think it was five point seven percent, and um, I bought this little house over in Westmoreland, and it just uh, turned out to be perfect. Eight hundred square feet. I, it was the first house I looked at. I told this realtor who was a friend of one of the nurses at the school. I said, I want a house with a fence and yard so I could get a dog and a fireplace in the living room because I never had one and my parents never had one. And the first house had both. And I said, I'll take it. That was it. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. And do you remember what you paid for it? I think it was uh, about $56,000. I think I put, my dad lent me, I remember $16,000 because I paid that off when I sold the house. Um, and um, yeah, that that's... That's what I paid and was it a 30 year mortgage back then or what do you remember um yeah i think it was right. yeah. yeah and then we looked it up and, and redfin says it's worth 530 thousand now so portland's yeah. grown a little bit in <laughs> the last 40 years um and then 
Do you remember what, so on the home front, interest rates, we were talking about this earlier, but do you remember what your interest rate was on the original mortgage on the Boring House? Yeah, that, um, we were kind of fortunate because it was a bank foreclosure. So interest rates were 13% then, and uh, we got it for 11. So that seemed like a great deal at the time. Yeah. Yeah. It makes these 7% loans today sound like a bargain too. Uh-huh. And what yeah. about the Westland house in 92 when you got that? Do you remember what that I was? I think when we bought it, it was, um, interest rates were down then. I think it was like 9 or 10%. And then we refinanced it a couple of times into the like 4 or 5%. Somewhere in there. must have felt good at nine or ten oh, yeah. after having. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so it perspective, a... people. <laughs> yes. And then, so right after fellowship, you and Pat decided to start your own practice, correct? You well, we had, during... we we actually decided during surgery residency. Uh, what happened is we um, there were a lot of groups of surgeons, and we we both decided we wanted to stay in the area, and um, the the. Gresham announced the light rail system was um, going to be built where it was going to connect Gresham into Portland. And Gresham also decided they were going to build a kind of outdoor mall. I think it was called the Gresham Town Center. So we kind of thought that was going to be a natural area to grow in the Portland area. And we uh, they didn't really have what I would consider high-quality high surgeons out there at that time. Um, so we met with the administrator. He made us all these promises of helping us out and such, which he didn't keep. But um, we decided we would just try to start our own practice and see if we could make a go of it. And um, so Pat finished general surgery, and he went directly into practice. He was actually working out of his car. He didn't even have an office then. Um, he And then eventually he was, like, leasing some space with, a primary care doctor so he could see some patients and follow up. And then I, I did my one year fellowship vascular in those days was just a one year fellowship. Um, and uh, then joined him when I finished. Yeah. What was it like getting the practice up and running off the ground? Oh, it, it was crazy. I mean, we took call everywhere. We were, we were taking emergency call at like four or five different hospitals. We were, staffing up at the VA hospital just to get more cases and um, we get a little stipend to come up there and um, we, we spent a lot of time in our car just running from hospital to hospital and 24 7 we took call all the time we were literally always on call hmm. and we'd help each other with all our cases and like mom and her friends would page us at the different hospitals so people would hear our names um, it, yeah, it was, uh, it was a challenge, but it, it was fun. I mean, we enjoyed it. And, you know, when I started, um, didn't have kids. So, and, and mom kind of got it, what, what it was going to be like, but, um, I'm glad we did it. I like being my own boss. Yeah. Was that more, was that common back then for people? No, okay. no cause most of the guys, and, and I had some opportunities, um, to join a couple of different practices, but most, most of the surgery practices were like two to four or five people. And if a guy retired or they were getting busier, they, they hire and, and oftentimes, you know, try to get one of the residents who, who were, was finishing at the med school. Um, but, um, we just decided we wanted to, because we, we really respected each other as friends, but as surgeons and thought we were very compatible. And um, um, we decided we were going to try that. Mm-hmm. What, 33 years later? You yeah, just did that for yeah, how long? Yeah, about 33, 34, mm-hmm. something like that. Yeah. It, it, private practices are more common back then in general, though, right? So. Yeah, they, they, there weren't really hospital-employed physicians. There were some hospital-based physicians, such as pathologists, radiologists, uh, ER docs, but most of them still had their own groups. Um, and, um, you know, pretty much everybody was um, in private practice. And, and then the thing that changed, um, I always say I was about 10 years too late in medicine because about our second, third year, 
that's when the HMOs started coming to Portland and, and things really changed. You know, it really um, affected the way we would get patients and how much we were being paid. All of a sudden, everything was being discounted. Um, and you sort of had to take the contracts or you didn't have business. And so is that, or were there other, what were some of the biggest challenges aside from that? Or do you think that was probably the biggest hurdle? Well, that became really a big issue because um, what what happened, uh, at least where we were, um, we, we were doing a lot of business with this one, uh, it was a sort of a multi-specialty clinic. Uh, it had pediatricians and primary care. So um, one, of, one of the first HMOs in Portland, which was called Secure Horizons, and it was a Medicare plan. And they basically gave clinics, and in this case, on the east side, there was one they, they gave basically all their patients, and they gave them a sum of money for each patient and then told them, you manage these patients and get sign up your own specialists and um, then you have to pay for all the specialty care. So the obvious solution to that was try to de deny as much care as you could and find other solutions rather than treating patients, which was much different than the typical fee-for-service. Um, but we signed a deal with them because they wanted us to be their surgeons, which turned out to be pretty fortunate because they started out in a small hospital on the east side called Woodland Park Hospital. But Woodland Park didn't have any cardiac care, so they had to contract their cardiac care at Providence. And after a year, they realized they were paying a fortune for uh, this cardiac care because they didn't really have a contract to, for lower fees. So they decided to do their whole contract with Providence, and they took us with them. So all of a sudden, we like instantly had a significant practice at Providence, and then we opened an office there, and then our practice grew substantially from there. And when, how far into how many years after you started, or was this pretty early? This was pretty early. This was about two to four years okay. or so after we started. Oh, yeah. So you that really helped. Did you guys have any mentors to go to to help you get the business going? Or um, no, not really. <laughs> blind, blind. <laughs> we just sort of, you know, just figured. You know, people always talked about availability and affability, and we just went around. We drank lots of coffee in the lounges at all these hospitals, and just tried to get to know the doctors and primary care doctors. And then, you know, again, we took call all the time. So. In those days, unlike today where no one wants to take call, we, we looked forward to it because the patients, uh, almost all of them that came to the emergency room had insurance. So we would get paid for these, plus it would get us access to the primary care doctors because in those days, the primary care doctors actually came to the hospital, made rounds on their patients. Some of them even assisted on the surgeries. So we got to know patient, or the the primary care docs and some of the other specialists through the emergency room call that we were taking. And then, you know, if you did a good job, got a good result, uh, sometimes it would you get some more patients because, you know, that was the other thing. If you called our office and said, I need somebody to see now, send them over. <laughs> you know, it was like we just tried to be readily available and uh, we, we tried to accommodate people. Yeah, good business model. Yeah. Yeah, it seemed to work. Um, and that that's one of the differences and one of the most difficult things about starting your own practice. You know, most of the people who would join a practice as a young surgeon had senior partners they could go to and, um, and get advice or show them films or discuss a case with. I used to go pretty much every Saturday, unless I was working, um, up to there was a vascular conference where all the vascular surgeons in town would come and we'd show cases and... Um, so you could always run cases by them. And then the, the guy I did my fellowship with, I, I would just call him up if, you know, run cases by him. Um, but it, it, it definitely wasn't like having a senior partner that you could really rely on. Yeah. No, that's gotta be challenging, but also exciting and fun because you yeah. get more experience on your own that way. Right. And, and, and Pat and I both in our, uh, chief year of surgery, <laughs> 
we chose because we we got the six of us that were chief residents got to choose. There was kind of a lottery thing. But Pat and I wanted as many cases as we could get. So we basically chose to do six months at the VA, our chief year, which the VA was just a wealth of patients and pathology. And I, I mean, we each did well over a thousand cases our chief year. Um, and, and the other guys were looking, they didn't want it. Like one guy was gone into colorectal surgery. He didn't want anything to do with that stuff. And so, so we got a tremendous experience, um, just as chief residents. Yeah. And then more or less the last call it decade of your time in practice, you're mostly doing the vein clinic from what I remember. How did that come? Well, that was like, I, I started it about. I think seven or eight years before I finished and the, the last like three or four years, I just did the veins. Well, I, I, you know, what was happening is more and more of the physicians were becoming employed. Uh, Providence, which was my predominant hospital, uh, you know, was starting to employ cardiac surgeons. It was clear they were going to start employing vascular surgeons, which they actually did before I finished at Providence, Portland. And again, I, I didn't really want to be employed by Providence. I wanted to be my own boss. Um, so at the time, um, there, there, was, there were no vein clinics in Portland. And the rep for the uh, Venus company, which was bought out by Medtronics, uh, he was trying to start a vein clinic and have all of us working for him. And I thought, why would I want to do that? Why not just open a clinic. So I, I, I did and it did very well. And, and, um, you know, I got some help from the company and, uh, that was making the catheter I was using cause I was using the radio frequency ablation catheter, not the laser catheter. Um, so it, it did really well as the only, um, vein center in Portland for several years, but then other people figured out that this was a pretty good thing to do. And there's, not a lot of emergencies in the varicose vein business. So um, a lot of non-vascular guys were opening up vein clinics. And basically, um, I got hurt by my own success in a sense, you know, that other people realize, hey, that's a good thing to do. And so clinics started opening up all over town. And, and I, there's quite a few now in Portland. But, but it, it, it worked out well because, um, you know, as I say, for the last – three or four years that I, I stopped doing arterial surgery um, and just did the vein surgery just as like it extended my career a few years. No more call. Yeah, I did. I, you know, I took call for my own patients, but I could do that from almost anywhere because I never got called in to see somebody with the vein stuff. What was the difference between starting a business in medicine back in the eighties versus mid two thousands? Well, rent was a lot higher for one. <laughs> um, it was it was a different kind of thing, but um, I, I basically used the knowledge I had from running the other practice to do this. But one thing I did have to learn how to do, um, you know, when I started practice, we didn't have computers. We used to dictate our charts. They, we'd have our secretaries type up our notes. We did our billings by hand. So over the years, we had to incorporate the computer and fax machines. I mean, I was really opposed to getting a fax machine. We didn't have cell phones. I mean, that was a huge thing. I, we used to, Pat and I used to drive around with a wad of quarters in our pocket because we'd get paged with our beeper. And, you know, if it was an ICU or something, you didn't know, could you drive from one hospital to the next if you're in the car or you had to pull off? So we knew where all the pay phones were and we'd stop and put the quarters in and, you know, make calls. But so when you got a cell phone, that really helped a lot. But, um, but then as the computers got more sophisticated, um, then there were search engines. And so, you know, I learned early on when I started the vein clinic about the, uh, search engine optimization company. And there was a company called, uh, MedPro, MedPro, I think that's what was they were out of boston and they were working with this venus company at the time and they would do one clinic in a, a city within 60 mile radius where they would do the seo part 
and they do all the marketing for you. And, you know, you paid for it. You paid a monthly fee, but it was really worth it. That was a huge thing because, you know, for a long time, anytime you put out, even other vein clinics that open, if you put them into a Google search, we would come up first. <laughs> uh, so it, it was really valuable. So, you know, I learned about the marketing aspects, which back when we started, no one did any kind of marketing. It was all just word of mouth, it sounds like, from yeah. primary care. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think probably one of the most impressive accomplishments is two of your main employees are with you basically your entire career. What do you think contributed to well, we attention? Had, and well, it wasn't happening? my personality. <laughs> um, <laughs> but we, we treated them well. We realized that, you know, we were in surgery a lot. So we needed people on the phones and dealing with the patients while we were unavailable um, you know, that were really good with the patients and they were good at communicating with us and um, they kind of knew our routines. Um, so we, we took care of them, you know, but financially as well as, I mean, I, you know, we helped buy them cars and help them with down payments with houses and things like that. Um, I, you know, Kathy, who you, well, you know well, um, I made a deal with her that I'd pay her an extra hundred dollars a month if she quit smoking and she did. Um, but we did things like that, that, you know, they appreciated and, um, they stayed with us. We actually had three people that, cause Jennifer worked for us and she left and she came back. Um, we had three people that are probably with us over 30 years. Wow. Yeah. Impressive. Yeah. It's uncommon today. And Doreen, um, I met, she was working at the med school in the clinic and I kept offering her a job and she never did. And then she finally got fed up and, and we hired her and she stayed with us. So she was done. Yeah. There you go. Now that you're retired, do you ever miss it? No, not one bit. Not even doing the surgery. When I, when I first did, I missed the surgery a little bit, but, um, no, I, 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 Medicine changed a lot. It wasn't as much fun at the end in, uh, with all the hospital politics, insurance stuff. You know, I, I, I worked at that um, uh, review organization, the independent review organization in Portland. And um, some of the stuff I saw there that the insurance companies were doing to patients, it, it just really turned me off. It wasn't why I went into medicine. I wanted to take care of patients. And it, it became, it, it got to the point where I was spending most of my time trying to get pre-approvals for procedures and such. And um, it, it just wasn't near as enjoyable. So I guess what were the biggest changes from when you started until you finished? Well, um, you know, the, the hospital systems grew tremendously. Like at Providence, when I was at Providence, Portland, Started out, there was one administrator and one assistant. When I finished, there were probably, you know, 25 administrators in the hospital or more. And the, the organization itself had grown tremendously. They had their own insurance company. And, the, and their goal, they wanted to be like the Kaiser model, where they own the physicians and they own the insurance company and they own the hospitals. And the difference was that the physicians weren't joint owners like Kaiser. Um, and... It um, it really changed how medicine was delivered in, in this area, and um, and then Legacy was trying to do the same thing, and um, so you know because of that, uh, uh, and a lot of physicians were finding it was harder and harder to make a living being in their own practice because of the reimbursements and such, um, and more and more uninsured or. Um, you know, Medicaid patients were in the mix. Um, so a lot of people started becoming employed by the hospital, which was what, like I say, Providence Legacy, they all wanted that because once they own the physicians, then they can dictate how much they're going to get paid. And, um, you know, you didn't, you didn't meet a lot of uh, my old colleagues who became employed physicians that were very happy with it. In fact, at the end, Pat did that the last couple of years, when I was doing just veins and um, he said it was the worst decision he made in his life numerous times. <laughs> so I, and that was to me that that was the biggest thing, you know, and it, it, it became clearly more of a big business versus, you know, just delivering health care. Um, 
so um, that that was one of the biggest things. I think the other couple things that were really different. Um, there was a big push toward lifestyle in in medicine and residency. The eight hour work week I think changed medicine dramatically. Um, um, I I think that um, the salaries. Um, were limited, the, the upside of the salaries. I mean, it, it, doctors still get paid well, but, um, you know, if you were willing to work as hard as we did, you could do really well. Um, and I, I don't think you had that option um, working for um, a hospital system, at least at the start. I, maybe it's better now. I don't know. Um, and again, insurance companies control a lot of the flow and so many of the procedures that we were doing, you'd have to get prior authorization, especially in the vein clinics that everything had to be prior authorized. And it was just amazing how uh, you'd get these procedures denied. And then if you appealed them, the people that were denying them, and I, I learned this again when I was doing this uh, IRO thing, um, they, they, they don't even have any training whatsoever in the procedures they're denying that most of these people were retired primary care doctors and and um they 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 were determining who needed vein procedures well they, they didn't really understand it and all of them had different criteria all the insurance companies um in terms of vein size and and how much reflux and this and that and and to me that just goes to show you that nobody knew what the right numbers were they were just making them up as they went um so that was really frustrating to me and um, took a lot of the joy out of the medicine because you couldn't just take care of patients which is what our goal was yeah not fun um switching gears to the finances you've always been pretty money and business savvy as we discussed on the business front already but where do you think that came from or where did your interest in money and business start well i think it my dad was really into it and my mother too i mean they were always talking about stocks and investments and things like that and then um you know when i had my bar mitzvah i, had, I got some money for gifts and so I decided I'd put it into stocks. I bought RCA and Campbell Soup. Both were in Cam Camden, New Jersey. Uh, you know, pretty large companies doing well at the time. And um, so, and I used to check the every day, you know, check the financial page and look at my stocks and how much I had. And, and I, that just continued. And I always, I always worked. I mean, even when I was like 12 years old, I was taking water ice uh, canisters out on a, little wagon like you know american flyer wagon and um selling it on the streets and trying to make some money and um i sold women's shoes in high school <laughs> um so i i don't know i just i think it came from my parents really and then i know investing like you mentioned it started at 13 yeah. and then specifically retirement savings was always a big focal point as long as i could remember when did i guess 13 is when you first started investing but what about once you started working when did that when did you really start saving so right from the get-go we we decided um you know when i was a resident my starting salary as an intern was eleven thousand dollars a year and um by the time I finished my seventh year uh, fellowship, I think I was getting paid twenty-three or four thousand dollars at that time, and so basically, you know, I was making a couple thousand a month. So Pat and I decided that um, we would keep our expenses about the same, and everything else we would invest. Um, so I was when I started practice, I would take home two thousand a month, and then when Occasionally, you know, when we'd have extra money, we'd um, take home a little bit more. But most of the time, I would just take it and invest it. And, and back in the um, early or mid-80s, late-80s, that was the beginning of the, the, the tech boom. And um, you've heard the story about Microsoft. And, uh, <laughs> I want you so, to share it because no one else has. <laughs> it's listening. So um, I, I used to get Money Magazine. And... Um, and this was, I think, my second year in practice. So this would have been like 1986 or so. 
um, and I read about this little company, Microsoft, that was going to go public. So I actually just looked up a couple local brokerages, talked to a couple guys about getting this on the IPO. I'd never bought an IPO before. And they said, oh, that's going to be sold out. That is, long story short, I said, well, I, one guy I talked to, I, I want to buy 400 shares um, right as soon as it's available after the IPO. So I think Microsoft came out at $25 a share, and I got it at $28 a share. And then it very quickly started rising and rising and rising. And the same guy who I had only talked to on the phone, he, he was a young guy because I, I met him later on. And um, he um, he kept calling me and said, you know, th this stock is crazy. It's 88 now and, and you know, the PE ratio and he talking all these numbers. And I said, yeah, but it's still going up, you know. And so eventually he talked me out of selling like 100 shares and then another 100 shares. And eventually I got out of all the shares and I, I made – you know, pretty good money at the time, but it then like almost every year would split. And I think it was somewhere in about the mid nineties, 2000, I went back and calculated what those 400 shares would have been worth. And it was about $35 million. <laughs> so that was one, one of the worst decisions I made uh, selling Microsoft, although I did buy it back uh, later on, but well, you probably, what, quadrupled your initial investment oh, in a few years? More, more so, yeah. But it, it still wasn't $35 million. <laughs> It wasn't <laughs> even close to that. Hindsight, yeah. right? Yeah. But, um, yeah, the, the, you know, in the tech days, um, things were doing well. And I, I, I had a broker, um, you know, Rudy, who I was, he was working with me. And, and we did really well for years. In fact, that's what paid for the beach house, so. Uh, was the my earnings in Dell and some of these other high tech companies? And so. Well, probably one of the biggest factors there is what you said earlier. You kept your expenses the same from residency right. to practice and just invested everything else. And we did it for a long time, and um, we we just thought, you know, if, if we took the money home and put it in a bank account, it would get spent. <laughs> and so we just. Like Pat trusted me and um, I did the investing and we did pretty well. Um, and then, so it's, when did you start the 401k for the practice? Was that? Oh, we like started right our first year. Okay. We started right away and we maxed out every year I was in practice. Do you remember what the limit was back then to max out? Um, I could probably look it up, but yeah, it, less not, than today. Yeah, it was maybe 13,000. Does that sound right? I probably that I don't remember. No, and it changed over the years, obviously. And and, it, and it, you know, in the beginning, we weren't making all that much money, you know. So the max, I think the max was, yeah. I, I'd have to go back and look it up. I, I can't remember, but we we did both IRAs and our four hundred one k, and our accountant, you know, helped us set all that up, and we we worked with the same accountant for. The thirty some years we were in practice, impressive. Yeah. Um, if you were to go back in time on the business and financial front, would you have done anything differently aside from hold on to Microsoft? Yeah, I would have held on to Microsoft, <laughs> and I would have got out of the tech market as it started coming down. I waited a little too long on that. Well, everyone um, did. Well, I'm just saying. In retrospect, that's why when COVID started, if you remember, I told you to I wanted to be in cash because I didn't want to lose money again. Because I had seen that happen a couple times, and uh, I, I thought I'd, I'm better off not losing money and not making money. Um, you know that that was my goal at this age and such. So, um, no, I I I, um, I think we did pretty well. So I I, I have no complaints. I mean, I, yeah, good. No regrets. What advice would you give prospective doctors? I don't know if there's any high schoolers or college students listening, but definitely have some med students. Well, yeah, up until recently, I I look at my children, who none of which are in medicine, and uh, are doing pretty well. 
um, in their thirties and I was, I didn't finish my fellowship till I was 32. Um, I'd say go up until recently go into software, but now I'm not sure. <laughs> I, I, but I, 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 I'm not, if you love it and it's just your life's passion, I, I think medicine is great and you always find a job. Um, but it's, it, for the amount of time and effort and the expense now, I mean, you know, we talked about tuition. I, I finished med school and college with $10,000 worth of debt that I had to pay back. Um, you know, I hear these stories of people with two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars $300,000 worth of debt. I think that's very difficult to pay back and live the lifestyle you would perhaps like to live, um, making the salaries you get now as an employed physician. Um, I, I don't know that it's worth it unless you absolutely love it. And two to 300 is just the average or some with a lot more than that. Right. And, and I don't know how you could do that. Um, I, I was very fortunate because my parents, you know, paid for my education, which I then paid it forward to you guys and paid your education. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, but I, I just think that um, I, I'm not sure I would do it again in today's environment. I don't know what I do, but I uh, probably start a business. Um, what about mid-career doctors? What would you advise them or, or doctors just getting started? Well, I think, you know, um, in as I look back and, you know, you've heard me talk about this. I mean, I, I regretted that I missed a lot of the family events and, you know, because I, I was working all the time. Um, so I missed a lot of birthday parties and soccer games and such. I made a lot of them, but I, I did miss some of the activities and um, I, I think it, it's nice that they have, you have a balance now, um, with more time to be with your family and, and that kind of thing. Um, but I'd also strongly recommend you find some other passions in life because that to me is the key to retirement is you, you need to have things you love to do that you can pursue and, um, and it'll make your life a lot better when you retire because you do sir i i was definitely worried about how am i going to fill my days and um now i kind of like having a day of nothing where i can just catch up on things and you keep yourself busy fishing and right yeah well fishing has always been a passion of mine and um, now i'm working a couple several shifts a month at a fly fishing shop which is a lot of fun and it's certainly less stressful than surgery and, um, you know, I'm doing a bunch of other things, doing bicycling, still backpacking. and um, Roast my own coffee. Some. Yeah, roast my own coffee now, make my own bread. Yeah. <laughs> um, what about, what, would you, what advice would you give to doctors in private practice? Those last remaining few that are still well, in it. Well, I, I, I think that it's really got to be difficult running a private practice in today's world. And, um, you know, out here in uh, Portland, the Oregon Clinic is a large specialty group that um, uh, it, it's still private practice, but you're doing it within the realm of a big group. And so they take care of your billing and hiring and such. And um, I, I think if, if I were still in practice or I would look for that type of situation, if it's a good group and, and big enough that it can... Um, because what they've been able to do is negotiate their own contracts because they um, hold on to um, a large portion of the specialists in Portland. So they have a monopoly on things like GI and, um, and cardiac and, and such. So they, they, um, they've got enough power and size that they can dictate to some degree how much they're going to get reimbursed. Um, but it's still not the same as having your own practice. So starting your own practice from scratch. Yeah, I wouldn't do that all. today. I don't think that would fly. It'd be pretty tough. Um, what about, aside from making sure you have hobbies, advice for doctors on the brink of retirement? Well, um, get yourself a good financial advisor if you don't have one. Because <laughs> you, you do need advice. And, and most of us, although we think we might be smart enough to do it, aren't smart enough to really 
make all those financial decisions for retirement because a lot of decisions that have tax implications, um, it's really helpful to have somebody like you doing this. Agree. Yeah. I'm biased though. Yeah. No, I, I'm, I think that's really important. Uh, what about, what advice would you give to your younger self? My younger self? Uh, I guess, um, again, I, I would uh, certainly try to spend more time with the young family um, if you can because you only get one shot at that. Um, I'd probably say don't work as hard because, you know, it, it, at the time it seemed like we were doing what we had to do to make a go of it, but um, I don't know if, if it really made that much difference. Um, but I also think you need to, um, it, it, you know, when you're younger, you have more energy, you have more patience. Um, so I don't know. I, 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 I don't have a lot of regrets about how things went, honestly. I mean, I, I think I'm proud of my kids, and, you know, been married for 36 years and You've been married longer than that. I'm 36. You got married. Oh, no. Yeah, right. 38. 38. 38 yeah. Who's counting? Who's, yeah. <laughs> um, anything else we didn't cover you think would be beneficial to add? Um, no, but, uh, well, I, one thing I will say is that, you know, for when you're first starting out, and uh, certainly consider disability insurance because it's expensive and, I, I thought, oh, I don't want to spend the money for this. Um, but it turned out I actually had to use it um, about 15 years into practice because I had neck issues and, and I, I lost the uh, motor function of my left hand and couldn't open and close clamps and do surgery, basically. And, and um, so, you know, we all worry about life insurance, but you're going to use a lot of a lot, a lot of people use their disability and they don't see the benefits of their life insurance. I, I think it's really important that you have disability insurance. Yeah, I totally forgot about that because you were unable to operate for yeah. what, a couple of years or how long was it? No, that? it was, it was um, probably about eight, nine months till I got back where I was able to do surgeries again. Because you, you, you got a procedure done to fix it, right? And it actually worked or? Well, it didn't. It did it turned out that the procedure, uh, I, it didn't fix what I had, but over time and, th and with uh, hand therapy, my uh, hand got better and I was able to get back to operating. Lucky. But it was pretty scary. And uh, that, that's the other thing. Um, you know, I would say is when that occurred, um, it really gave me a new appreciation for what I was doing because I didn't want to have to go out on those terms that I couldn't operate anymore. Um, you want to be able to go out on your own terms, which I did. And, um, that, that was a, a good feeling. But, uh, when that happened, it really sort of made me refocus on what I had and what I was doing and how much I missed it when I couldn't do it. Yeah. In the middle of my career. No, it would have been scary. We'd have had a little bit different life. I imagine if that yeah, persisted, would have, would have changed dramatically. Well, thank you for taking the time. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, <laughs> Hope this was helpful no, to somebody is, out there. Yeah, this is good. We need the content, and selfishly, it's I think it's good to have a, a recorded conversation between us. So <laughs> we'll say hello right. to this one. <laughs> okay. All right. All right.